is our first lecture for AP Biology, and I'm having you watch this video at home so that we can move along a little more quickly, particularly because it's a really easy chapter, and also it should be, for the most part, a review of what you've already learned. So this chapter is about the characteristics of living things. In other words, since biology literally is the study of life, we're going to start with a basic definition of what life is. And so there's characteristics that all living things share, and depending on the book you look at, they're going to have seven characteristics, five characteristics. Uh, it really just depends how they separate them. They're the same characteristics, but some of them get lumped together or separated into two. So we're going to go through them um, the way your book does. And so the first characteristic living things um, share is that they're organized. In other words, they're put together in a particular way. And we actually know these levels of organization, which I'm sure you've learned. In other words, we start at the chemical level with atoms, and the atoms make um, compounds. And then if those compounds are assembled in a particular way, we get organelles. And an organelle is a cell part that carries on a particular function. If we assemble several organelles in a particular way, we get a cell. And it goes on from there, tissue, organ. I have the definitions of these as we go on. So we call these properties of living things, we call them emergent properties. In other words, a property that results from a particular arrangement. In other words, if you um, have wheels and uh, a chain and whatnot, you don't actually have a bicycle. You can't call it a bicycle until it's assembled. And the same thing is true here. If you're talking about a living multicellular organism, it's not actually a dog until you assemble it with a circulatory system and a you know, respiratory system, and those systems then consist of organs, you know, the circulatory system, so you're going to have the arteries and the veins and the heart and all of that. And so these properties don't emerge until you get to a particular level and there's an organization in a particular way. So another way that they're organized, and this is another characteristic that living things have, is that all living things are made out of cells. Now some living things consist of just a single cell. And so that's why we say that the smallest unit of life that can perform acquired activities is the cell, because there are some organisms that just consist of one cell. Okay, and then cells can be subdivided into two different types, prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic literally translates um, sort of the first cells or before the nucleus. Karyote actually translates, I think, into kernel, like a kernel of corn. But... Prokaryotic cells, very simple, they don't have a nucleus. There's other properties, but that's the main one most people remember. They're smaller, you can see over here the prokaryotic cell. It's our bacteria. And then eukaryotic cells, which are the ones that have a nucleus. The prefix EU, eukaryotic, is a true nucleus. And so the, this would be an example of a eukaryotic cell, much bigger, the one with all the organelles that we're more familiar with. This, uh, this diagram is just showing the levels of uh, organization in another uh, way. So here's your molecules, and then several molecules organize in a specific way. We have the emergent property of an organelle. And then cells, tissues, uh, organ systems, the whole, the whole thing. I have the definitions here. Um, so a tissue is a group of cells that work together. For example, muscle tissue um, consists of cells that have certain properties, uh, such as the property to contract. Um, organs are groups of tissues. So for example, if we look at the heart, the heart is an organ, but it's, it's composed of um, tissues that include epithelial. It's got a lining in it. It's got muscular tissue, particular cardiac muscle cells, um, et cetera. And then organ systems, you have the heart. It can't survive on its own. Um, the whole system, the circulatory system is the heart, but it also includes the arteries and the veins and the capillaries and all of that. And then an organism, that's an emergent property that we see, a multicellular organism, I should specify, doesn't emerge until we see all the organ systems functioning together. Or on or multicellular organisms, what we see is that the individual cells of a multicellular organism can't live on their own. Um, they rely on other cells around them, whereas a single-celled organism has all the organelles. What we see in multicellular organisms is that they don't. Um, so you have cells, for example, in plants, you have um, phloem, and phloem cells carry food down the plant. But phloem cells don't have mitochondria. They don't have a way of uh, basically producing energy. So there's companion cells that work with them, making this whole tissue and organ system and those cells provide 
the, the, um, the energy. So what we see, again, in a multicellular organism is that there's a, a division of labor, and they're, in, they're not independent anymore. A population is a group of organisms of the same species. You can have like a population of deer, a population of ducks. They tend to be, though they need to be kind of interbreeding in a particular area. And then a community is several populations. So a pond community would be the fish, the algae, um, you know, plankton, if we're talking about the ocean, um, you know, the, all the little invertebrates in the bacteria, etc. An ecosystem is, is basically these communities and then add to them the non-living things. So the minerals in the water, um, the amount of water available, the acidity of the soil, all that non-living stuff around them that's going to affect them. And then the biosphere just it means all the inhabitable areas of the whole earth. So these are our levels of organization. All right, another way we can look at uh, levels of organization is taxonomy. Taxonomy um, is those levels you learn, kingdom, phylum, class, etc. The biggest one is domain. Everything belongs to a particular domain. Originally, kingdom was the highest level, but as we've discovered more and more differences between organisms, we needed a level above kingdom. And so domain is our, is our separating level. Now we have eubacteria, the true bacteria, domain archaea, which is our archaebacteria, and then eukarya, which is our eukaryotes. And there's some discussion about which one's more related to us. Um, you know, originally you think archaebacteria, oh, that would mean, you know, the ancient ones, the first bacteria. They live in uh, weird places where there's no oxygen, stuff like that. Uh, but what, we dis what we've discovered, and again, there is some controversy. If you go on Google, you'll find some that say yes, some that say no, is that sometimes what we see is that archaeobacteria have a lot more in common as far as their organization, their, um, their, the proteins they make, et cetera, with eukaryotic cells, the cells that compose uh, us and plants and all of that, than the eubacteria do. All right, and so here's your, here's your levels of classification. I have three organisms here, leopard, leopard, human, and parrot, just to show you. So we all belong to the domain eukarya, so we have that in common. Next comes kingdom. Well, we're all, all three of those are in the animal kingdom. If we had a plant over here, the plant would be in eukarya, but now it wouldn't have anything else in common. After that level, it wouldn't match up, So because a plant would be in the kingdom plant. Um, then we have phylum. Since all three of these have backbones, um, then they belong to the phylum chordata. So they have that in common. I spelled that wrong, let's see. Um, class, now you see where a leopard and a human are more closely related than either of us are to the birds because the birds are in a different class. They're in aves or aves, and aves have certain characteristics, beaks, feathers, etc. Mammals have different characteristics, giving milk to their young, um, live birth for most of them, and all of that stuff. Carnivora and primates. So now we see that the human and the leopard separate. Now if, let's just say, ape was in here, apes would be more closely related to humans than the leopards because we'd get down here and they would still be uh, in the same order as, as we are. And then uh, we have the family, genus, and then the species. And so this is our um, sort of a breakdown. Uh, you don't have to know the specifics of these three. You do need to know these levels. Sometimes I've heard uh, like kings play chess on fine gold sheets. Um, and, uh, and then uh, somebody in my class came up with, dang, Kevin, please come over for good, let's just say spaghetti. Um, so Kevin, please come over for good spaghetti. Uh, or darn, Kevin, and it's an easy way to remember it. Okay, um, scientific names. So binomial nomenclature. Nomenclature means a naming system. Binomial means two. And so binomial nomenclature means we have a two-name system for naming things. The genus is first. The species is second. Um, typically, they're based on Latin. You saw those weird words on the prior page. We capitalize the genus. And either it's in italics, if you see it uh, in a book or something, you may see it probably in italics, or you have to underline it if you write it out. Also, sometimes we can see um, the genus shortened. So if you have a book and it's talking about Homo sapiens and it mentions it a bunch of times, it may say Homo sapiens the first time, and then after that it's probably just going to be H sapiens. So I have a cute little thing here. Uh, in class I was going to have us do this. So 
whether these were written correctly or not. So if we look at E. coli, uh, the, the initial, that's fine. The problem, there's actually two. Number one, it's not underlined or italics. And number two, the, um, the C is capitalized and it shouldn't be. And then Lumbricus terrestris, um, problem with that one, again, not underlined or italics, and the T is capital, so that's not right. Here's another one, Paraplatoma americana. This one, yes, we've got the capital and then the lowercase, but again, it's not underlined or italics. It needs to be one or the other. This one's fine, Rosa damascana. This one, capitalized, lowercase, underlined. Musa sapientum, uh, missing the capitalization, uh, no, sorry, capitalized, fine, not underlined or italics. This one's fine, hydro coeris, hydro Paris. Uh, we have it in italics, we have a capital, we have a lowercase. C familiaris, this um, would be fine if somewhere prior they had actually said what this stood for. This is actually canis familiaris. The fact that it's in italics is fine. And then Yersinia pestis, there's a problem with this one, and that is that it's both italics and underlined, and you choose one or the other. Um, for fun, you can match them up. Um, I'm not going to give you the answers. All right. So our six kingdoms, here they are. RK bacteria, that's our ancient ones. U bacteria, which is true bacteria. Those are our two prokaryotic uh, kingdoms. And then our eukaryotes, eukarya, that's the remainder of our kingdoms, the, the um, under eukarya. Protus, protus, there's some question about whether it's even a kingdom. They are um, thinking about kind of revising it. And um, it, so right now, it, um, it isn't even for sure that it's going to stay a kingdom. But generally, what kind of gets thrown in there are all the things that don't fit in any other kingdom. So generally, they have one cell, or maybe they're colonial, meaning they have a bunch of cells that live together, but they're not necessarily interdependent on each other. So it's a little different than a multicellular organism where cells have lost their ability to live on their own. Um, Animal-like ones are called protozoa, like your amoeba, paramecium, those pond organisms. The plant-like ones are called algae, like chlorophyta is green algae. And then the fungus-like ones are called slime molds. Um, so they kind of just get thrown in there because they don't quite fit any other kingdom. Fungi, uh, like your mushrooms, molds, mildews, what they all have in common is that they're multicellular. They have a cell wall made out of chitin, and that's pronounced chitin, not chitin. And they're heterotrophic. Not only are they heterotrophic, but they all absorb food. They all secrete enzymes that break down their food, and then they absorb it, which is a little different than animals. Um, plants are multicellular also, but they're autotrophic. They make their own food, and they have cell walls made out of cellulose. So fungi and plants both have cell walls. In fact, lots of protists do as well, and most bacteria do. So when we say, oh, you know, um, plants are the only ones with cell walls, that's, that's actually, no, that's not right. Actually, it's, it's more correct to say that animals are the only kingdom that none of them have cell walls because all the other kingdoms have at least some of their organisms with cell walls. And so animals, multicellular, no cell wall, and we ingest our food. We either filter feed, um, in some cases, um, like a parasite, maybe they, they absorb it, but for the most part, we ingest our food, we eat. Here's some pictures of different kingdoms. Um, a lot of people don't know ringworm is actually a fungus. That's ringworm here on the right under fungi. Um, it's not a worm. It's actually a fungus and it actually uh, spreads out in a ring as it's uh, basically dissolving your skin because remember funguses, that's what they do. They absorb their food, dissolve what's around it. Um, the next characteristic is that living things metabolize. Metabolism is basically energy uses. Anabolism, they build up, and catabolism, they break stuff down. And here's a cute little picture of it. We have the sun, the flowers absorb the sun, the cow eats the flowers, and we eat the cow. And this is sort of a, a passing on of energy and the metabolism of each of these organisms leading to the survival of the next organism. And the other thing is that all living things maintain homeostasis or a balance. 
Um, they maintain stable internal conditions, and I'll talk about that in part two. This is part two of the characteristics of living things. We're going to start, we, in part one, the main characteristic that we discussed was the fact that living things are organized, and we talked about all the levels of organization in living things. We talked about emergent properties, properties that we see as we put the smaller parts together. Uh, we see uh, things become more complicated, and we see the, the beginnings of an organ from tissues. We see an organism coming from organ systems and tissues put together in a proper way, etc. So we're moving on to other things that all living things share. And so the second one is that living things metabolize, which means they use energy. I know I touched on this barely in the, in the part one. All living things use energy. As a matter of fact, this is yet another reason why viruses are not considered alive. They do not metabolize. They are a little set of DNA. Um, and all they basically do is float around, attached to a cell, and when they attach properly, it sort of creates this little opening and their DNA goes into the cell. That's it. And then the cell builds viruses and it goes from there. So there is no metabolism in a virus. And so by our definition, technically a virus is also not a living thing. Uh, and then homeostasis is a huge theme and it comes up on the AP exam a lot, uh, especially for example, when we talk about hormones and negative feedback, for example, so for example, you have a, a feedback loop that exists between calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Uh, one of them will cause your bones to pull calcium out of the blood and deposit it. Uh, but if there's not enough calcium, because calcium is necessary for muscle contraction, then the other hormone would be released, which is now going to cause your bones to release the calcium back into the blood for the muscles. So you have this relationship between these two hormones, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone, that maintain levels. Um, your hypothalamus controls temperature. So if you start to get too hot, a message gets sent to cause you to sweat, open up your pores, dilate your blood vessels, um, and therefore cool off your body. If you start to get cold, then your hypothalamus sends another message, the opposite message, form goosebumps, which are going to trap heat. It makes the hairs on your arms and legs stand up that traps heat next to your skin. Your blood vessels constrict. You start shivering, which, causes, which is actually your muscles contracting, which generates heat. So we see negative feedback a lot because we have to maintain, living things maintain a, a balance, a state of homeostasis. Okay. Um, the flow of energy goes along with all of this as well, and, and there's an important thing that you need to understand, and that is energy is not created or destroyed. You've heard of that, the law, first law of thermodynamics, but it does get transformed. So we're not creating energy. Um, you know, plants don't create energy for animals. What's happening is, is the energy is changing forms. It's going from the sun, the, the producers, the plants, and other prokaryotic, um, sorry, um, autotrophic organisms can now convert that energy into energy that's in, stuck in the bonds, the bonds of the sugars. Then when we eat the sugars, the energy is now going to be converted into other forms. So energy is being transformed. It gets stored temporarily in bonds. Um, the final form of energy is heat. So eventually all of the energy is, is being transformed into uh, basically a, a form that's less useful. Eventually it becomes heat. Now matter is recycled even though energy is not. So you have your producers, which are taking that energy and they are trapping it in sugars. And then you have your consumers um, that pick up the energy by eating the producers. So you see the energy being passed along. Now, when a consumer dies, what's gonna happen is our decomposers are gonna recycle the matter that's there. And some of that matter still contains energy. So the energy is not necessarily being recycled. What's happening is that the energy that was still trapped is now being passed on again. And um, so it's, it's a very important thing. The matter can be recycled, the nutrients can be recycled, but the energy is not recycled. It's just passed from one place to another, changing forms. A good example uh, that we see of this is uh, of matter recycling would simply be the photosynthesis cell respiration cycle. Photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide. It releases oxygen as a byproduct whereas cell respiration requires oxygen and releases carbon dioxide as a byproduct. So we see a, a cycling right there of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. So that would be an example of you know, chemicals getting recycled.
this is just a, a little diagram. Inter living things interact with other organisms and with their environments. In other words, we see competition, even in plants, there's competition for space, there's competition for light in the rainforest. Little short plants are not going to do very well because the taller plants have um, huge leaves and they're taking the sunlight. But all living things interact with others. If you think about this little picture I put here, you have the tree. The tree provides home for some organisms. Um, it changes the composition of the air by releasing oxygen into the air. It also is changing the soil composition. Uh, when it dies, it is now adding nutrients to the soil that can allow other things to grow. So there's a lot of interaction between all living things and what's around them. That's the whole population community ecosystem levels that we talk about. Another one is that living things reproduce. And, and basically, you can't see my little comment there. Let me move this down. Um, the idea is that when we say living things reproduce, we're talking about DNA. <laughs> all living things contain DNA. And then DNA um, gets incorporated into we our genes and chromosomes. In us, in, in eukaryotic organisms, we see those little X-shaped things. Those are the chromosomes. Um, and in prokaryotic organisms, the DNA is usually found in a loop. But the bottom line is, it's still genetic information. If you think about it, you know, you have a sperm and an egg, and all that's in there is DNA. And just that DNA uh, then has the ability to send instructions to build an entire baby from a single cell that's, that's just, has no characteristics of uh, a baby. And so, uh, and what genes really do is they control the production of proteins. And you, you know, we're made out of other things besides proteins, but proteins are really responsible for the major structures and functions of our body. Um, enzymes are proteins. Most hormones are proteins. Uh, proteins in the cell membrane control what enters and leaves. So <coughs> pigments are proteins. Um, hemoglobin that carries oxygen in your body is a protein. So protein production is, is the most important thing at, that's going to give us our characteristics. And so the DNA is the blueprints. All living things have DNA, and the DNA is the only thing that gets passed on to the next generation when living things reproduce. And then finally, living things evolve. And evolution is a core theme in biology. You hear it a lot, and I know it can be a, you know, oh, I believe in evolution, I don't believe in evolution. But um, specifically, the focus in here is on evolution in the sense that organisms can change over time. In other words, you can have organisms that are extinct. They have, um, they are ancestors of organisms that exist today. You have extinct groups of tortoises, and we see the tortoises today. And why do those tortoises exist today? Well, because probably what's happened is there have been mutations. The mutations gave some tortoises different characteristics. If those characteristics were beneficial, natural selection, survival of the fittest, would decide the fate of the characteristic. If it's a beneficial characteristic, it may have helped that organism live longer, reproduce more, and pass that trait on. And it's not just natural selection, it's also sometimes random chance. Sometimes a trait is a really good trait, but if the organism that has it, for whatever reason, doesn't happen to reproduce, then that trait may die with, you know, it will die with the organism. Um, but natural selection combined with chance and mutations are what give organisms new traits, new abilities, and that is the basis when we talk about evolution being a theme. It's all related. The genetics uh, is the heritable uh, material that's being passed on, and we know that mutations happen. I think it's one uh, in every million genes copied has mutations, something like that. Um, so there's small numbers of mutations going on all the time. And we can see the relationship between organisms using DNA. We, you know, we build cladograms and family trees. The whole system of classification that we have, although it's built from lots of things, one of the major things we use today to look at how closely related organisms are is we look at their DNA. Because if they, if they have similar biochemistry, if their DNA has genes that make the same exact proteins, we can determine that they may be very closely related to each other. And here's just a, an example uh, your book actually had, which I thought was a really good example of mutations and selection. Probably this is not natural selection. I would be willing to, to bet that some of these pigeons, these are all pigeons, 
And I'm sure that some of these pigeons have come about by artificial selection, that we have chosen for whatever reason to breed pigeons for a particular trait that we like. We do it with dogs too. You know, you see the cute little wrinkly Sharpays and, um, you know, beagles and collies and, you know, working dogs. Um, all, dogs have all sorts of different characteristics and they've been bred specifically to be good at certain things. And uh, so that's artificial selection. But the bottom line is these different traits come about by mutation and then they either get passed on or they don't. And by getting these new combinations every time an organism reproduces, we get just a huge variety. And in this case, I think this is a really good example of extreme variety in these um, pigeons. And the last thing your book um, has in this chapter, and I think it's an important note, is that there's unity. This whole thing has been about, partly about characteristics that living things have in common, um, and then we've talked about how living things are different. And probably the, the important thing to take, to take from this is that even though we're different, there are some things that we all have in common. And a good example is DNA. DNA is universal. If I take DNA from a jellyfish that codes for glowing, which we're gonna do, and put it into a bacteria, the bacteria will make the same protein and glow because the DNA is translated the same way. If a, a particular three-letter code codes for making a particular amino acid in a frog, it will make the same amino acid no matter what organism we put it in. So DNA is, is interpreted universally the same. Um, and we see you know, all living things, again, are made of cells. They all metabolize. They all reproduce. And so even though we're diverse, remember that there is unity as well. There's, these are the core characteristics that this whole chapter sort of been about are the core characteristics of what we have in common with each other. So hopefully, if you have questions, come see me in class. But hopefully, although I talked through this really quickly, um, I think it's a pretty easy chapter, and, um, and that's it. <laughs>